Well, we begin the final few messages in the book of Acts. We're moving toward the end of the last chapter. I hope that all of us have learned something from Acts because Acts is the church in action. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really not just the Apostles. We see the church in action all the way through the book of Acts, and I hope that we have learned a few things about what we as a church are supposed to be doing, not just what we're supposed to be believing, although that's the foundation, but if you have the right foundation, if you really believe what the Word of God says, it will change your life. It will change what you do. How important is that? We're in Acts chapter 28, verses 17 through 24. The title of the message, All Hear But Only Some Believe, really ties in with what I've just said. They all hear. Some even pretend to be Christians, but only a few believe and only a few have their lives changed. What's the famous question that I often ask? So you say you're a Christian, so how has that changed your life? If you really believe, it changes your life. I'm going to begin the few verses before which we finished last week because that runs us into what we have for tonight. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days, and from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Apiforum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. <laughs> Not that I had aught to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters of, out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that it is everywhere spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, they came to him many to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Aren't you glad I don't preach sermons that long? Paul was known for his long sermons. Preached all night, in one case a guy fell out of the window. Here he preaches from morning till evening. But you know it's not a matter of how long you preach or what you preach because Paul always preached the truth. Some believe and some do not. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight as your word goes forth, you will give us believing hearts. a very sobering and serious thing to realize that there are those who hear. They even hear very clearly and articulately with human intellect and understanding, and they choose not to believe. 
how serious this is in relation to salvation. But we as those who are saved often hear and do not believe because it is inconvenient. It goes against our pride or it goes against our tradition or it goes against our flesh. And so we harden our hearts. Father, keep us from hardening our hearts. Cause us, when we hear, to believe. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick review of those verses in last week. Verse 11 told us that they were on the island of Melita, the ancient name for Malta, which was under the procuratorship of Sicily. They were there for three months. During that entire time, Paul was the guest of the Roman government through the governor. And we're going to talk about that in the final message in this series of uh, when is it right to accept the support of the government. <laughs> but we're not going to get to that tonight. Uh, God started the healing ministry that Paul exercised at the top government official level, and then that opened the door for his ministry throughout all the rest of the island. Even before Paul reached Rome, he had the opportunity to preach to an entire ship of over 200 people, a captive audience. And then God let him have three months to reach an entire island with the gospel before he got to Sicily and Italy. Alexandria, as we saw, was the fountainhead of Gnostic heresy that crept into the church. That was a major problem in the early church. Some of you know that. Some of you have heard Dr. Waite speak on that subject. It was from Alexandria that many of the defective Bible texts and manuscripts were produced, which underlie most of the defective modern translations, which leave out many verses, change words and phrases in the text, and actually insert heretical doctrines. A lot of your modern translations are based on the text that came out of that particular cult. It's also from Alexandria that many of the heresies that reject the literal interpretation of scripture have their roots. We talked about those last week, such as the allegorical method of interpretation that has led to the theologies of our amillennialism and postmillennialism and the denial of literal prophetic future for Israel. It was at Alexandria that the heretical teaching of origin developed, confusing the church with Israel and saying that God no longer had promises for Israel, but that the church is now the Israel of God. That, by the way, folks, is false teaching. If you didn't pick that up, I said the heretical teachings of origin. In other words, it wasn't a very good place theologically. Castor and Pollux, down there in verse 11, those are the twin sons of Zeus and Leda who were deified and their names given to the bright stars in the constellation of Gemini. And we talked a lot about that last week. Syracuse in verse 12, that was where they made landfall in Sicily on the southeast coast. The town's still there today. Uh, Luke is giving a very detailed account of their trip. Regia, so we know these, it's got a lot of factual material in it as you go through it, which is one of the signs of authenticity. Uh, verse 13, that's the modern town of Regio in the Straits of Messina. Putioli, the modern city of Pazuoli in the Bay of Naples. And we talked about Josephus being shipwrecked there at one point. We saw the change in the treatment of the Apostle Paul, how the Roman centurion gave him a good deal of freedom uh, when he delayed his march to Rome by a full week just so Paul could spend some time with Christians who were there. Uh, obviously, the centurion had been impressed by the Apostle Paul uh, on the journey where they shipwrecked, uh, and he saw that Paul spoke the truth. He saw the snake bite him. He saw Paul heal people on the island for three months. He may have become a real believer. We don't know for sure, but he certainly gave deference to Paul when he held up the march to Rome by a week so Paul could spend some time with the Christians who were there. Word went ahead that Paul was coming. We noticed a number of things. Number one, there were already believers in the area. We know earlier from Paul's writings that the Apostle Paul had written about going through that area and how he was hoping to do so. There were believers whom he had led to Christ who were obviously traveling around the region. We found the Apostle Paul had spent some time with Priscilla and Aquila and uh, how they had been driven out of Rome earlier. A lot of things are going on here, but now we've got believers back in Rome, people who are Jewish believers as well as those who are Gentile believers. Paul probably had some converts on his proposed journey to Spain. The people anyway knew who Paul was and they were very excited to see him. Their presence brought thanksgiving, it brought joy, it brought confidence, it brought encouragement to Paul because soon he knew he would have to face Caesar. And so we asked the question, which was really sort of how we closed the message last week. 
Where you go, no matter where it is, you will be known. Every place you go, somebody will know who you are. You know, I have discovered that over the years. I've shared with you many times how I've been someplace that I thought nobody would know me, and somebody came up and said, aren't you Christian Spencer? I say, how did you know? <laughs> Recognized your voice. Apparently I have a distinct voice. Or we knew your dad and we knew you when you were a little kid. Why does God do that? Well, he does it for the same reason that we see with Paul here. Their presence brought thanksgiving, joy, confidence, and encouragement to Paul. But God does that for another reason as well. God does that to remind us that he's always watching. He always has somebody there who could help us if necessary, but that means there's also somebody there who is watching. God watches, that's for sure, but most of the time we ignore him. We think he's invisible, doesn't see us. We're going to get away with something. The angels are watching. There are holy angels who are watching you all the time. I hope you remember that. Because God has assigned at least one angel to each one of you who are believers. Even you guys who are younger. Angels watching you. There are angels here in this room. We can't see them, but the Bible says they're here. They're ministering spirits sent to those who will be the heirs of salvation. It says so in the book of Hebrews. There are also demonic spirits who are watching you all the time. They are learning everything they can about you. This past week I was previewing a video which I hope to show at some point uh, here at the church. I always like to do that in advance because sometimes I get a defective video that gets stuck in the middle or DVD and then I have to send it back and get a new one. That happened with this one, although I was able to make it past that point uh, by backing it up, running it forward, backing it up, running it forward, skipping a section. Finally got where I heard, saw all the rest of the end of it. But it was talking about how right now there is no such thing as privacy. Because every time you go on the internet, a record is made of that, and the information is being collected, at least for the time being, for commercial purposes, so that specific retailers can target you with advertisements that will pop up on whatever you've got. Every time you go out there doing a search, and then pretty soon stuff starts showing up at the first part of your email. You always have a couple of lines up there that says, you know, here's some things that you might be interested in kind of stuff. But that's going to work very well for the Antichrist, who will have a dossier on every person on the planet who has ever monkeyed around with an electronic device, which is almost everybody. The word demon comes from the word da. It's an Old Testament Hebrew root which means to know. They are the knowing ones. Satan already has his information system in your life right now. He watches you all the time. You are watched. That's why God watches you all the time. That's why the holy angels are assigned to watch you all the time. You don't get away with anything. Records are being made. And God often, I think always, places his people at strategic locations around the world so that if necessary, he can use them for encouragement, help, comfort to other believers who are walking by faith, who are walking in fellowship with him, to show that he is caring for you. But it's also a reminder he's watching you, and so are others and you have a testimony that you must bear. Well, enough meddling and back to preaching. So, anyway, we find the Apostle Paul. Now we move into the second half, where Paul has called the Jews together. This is the new material for tonight. Paul has called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, and then we have his little speech to them. So the first thing that we notice in our passage for tonight is that Paul uses the same method that he's used before. 
he first goes to the Jews. Now, I think most of you are related to that and are familiar with that phrase as it relates to the first century presentation of the gospel. But are you aware that that phrase, to the Jew first, also applies to at least two other areas? I think you're all aware of Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. Now, what's Paul doing here? First thing it is, he says, after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. He's just gotten to Rome. He's just settled in. He's learned that there is a synagogue here at Rome. There's a, an active group of Jews going on, so he calls their leadership together. He calls the chief of the Jews together. When they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I've committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He calls the leaders together. He begins with the leadership of the Jewish community. Paul always tried to preach the gospel to the Jews first in each location because they would already have a foundation laid to understand and to receive the gospel. The synagogues all over that area of the world were weekly teaching the Hebrew Old Testament and many Jewish boys had memorized large portions of the scripture. Some had even memorized the entire Old Testament. Did you know there's still kids that do that today? Hello, all you young people out there. Memorize the entire Bible. Did you know there are Muslim young people? The age of some of you who are the youngest in your families who have memorized the entire Quran. It shows commitment. It doesn't just show brains. It shows commitment. It shows dedication. It shows total focus. I think Paul had probably memorized the entire Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures. He memorized it Hebrew, not in English, guys. Of course, he spoke Hebrew too. He knew it. He was zealous for it. Are you zealous for scripture? If we had a contest tonight, and if I was going to offer a million dollars for anybody who could quote 200 verses word perfect, and I actually had a million dollars here. Had a banker up here. Had a guard with a gun. He had the money laid out on the table. I said, if any of you can quote 200 verses perfectly, I will give you a million dollars. Would any of you even try? If you'd try, raise your hand. You'd try. How far do you think you would get? Do you think you'd get to 200? You'd all look for the verses like, well, let's see this verse in John. Uh, Jesus wept. Okay, I got one. <laughs> okay. uh, John 3.16. Uh, for God so loved the world. You know, we'd be getting a bunch of stuff like that. How many of you could quote a whole book? Could any of you quote all the way through the book of Psalms? I mean, hey, if you could quote Psalm 119, you'd be well on your way. What's it worth to you? The Word of God. Do you have a regular systematic program for memorizing Scripture? Have you ever had a regular systematic program for memorizing Scripture? If yes, why did you stop? You weren't getting anything? Did you know you were getting something? You were getting something that would last forever? When you hide God's word in your heart, it keeps you from sin and it gives you heavenly rewards because it directs your path. It gives you light. It teaches you obedience. And each time you follow it and obey, the rewards go up. I'm doing a lot of meddling tonight, aren't I? Well, anyway, many of the Jewish boys had memorized large portions of Scripture. Some had memorized the entire Old Testament, and I think that puts us to shame. Paul preached Christ. It says so here in the passage, out of the Old Testament, because the New Testament obviously was not yet fully written. He expounded to them Christ out of the law and out of the prophets from morning till evening. 
He didn't have a Bible full of footnotes with him either. He was preaching Christ to them, and it doesn't even say that he had a whole bunch of scrolls with him. I doubt if he would have been able to carry a bunch of Old Testament scrolls written in Hebrew through the storm to the island, from the island to all the different places they stopped and finally get there to Rome and unroll the scrolls and start preaching to these guys. And he preached all day long. And he knew enough scripture to be able to point out Jesus in each of the Old Testament books, just like Jesus did in the Gospel of Luke to the two on the road to Emmaus. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I've asked this kind of question before. How many of you can tell me something about Jesus out of the book of Joel? How many of you can tell me something about Jesus? Here's an easy one. Out of the book of Habakkuk. Is that an easy one? Hmm. It is. Have you ever heard the phrase, the just shall live by faith? That comes from Habakkuk. Now, I think, I hope, that if I asked you to tell me something about Jesus out of the book of Genesis, you could at least point me to Genesis 3.15, which is the promise of the coming seed. Can you use the scripture to lead a Jewish person to Christ out of the Old Testament? That's what Paul was doing. He was talking to Jews who knew the Old Testament and merely saying, have you considered this verse? Have you considered this verse? Have you considered this verse? It points to Jesus. But only God can open the heart. They all heard exactly the same message, but only some believed. Now, you know something? All of you tonight are hearing exactly the same message. But only some of you will believe. How do I know? Because when you really believe something, it changes your life. If you never learn anything else from me, remember that. When you really believe, it changes your life. All right. Paul was preaching Christ to them out of the Old Testament, and they would, of course, understood since the Messiah is clearly described in the Old Testament. We spent a good deal of time talking about Paul's missionary methods when we started the study of Acts, so we won't repeat all of that now. But I want to draw your attention to a very important principle that is developed for us in this passage. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. That's stated in all three of the Gospels. Jesus said it. Because the Jews had the giving of the law and all the special revelation of the Old Testament, they had a greater accountability than the Gentiles. And therefore, they would suffer greater punishment for rejecting the Messiah. Their privilege is clearly stated for us in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much, every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the written scriptures direct from, from the mouth of God to the prophets. To whom much is given from him shall much be required. And so we discover the second way in which to the Jew first and also to the Gentile is used in the New Testament. The first was in relation to salvation, the coming of the Messiah to, G to the Jews, the prophecies of the Old Testament to the Jew first. But did you know that 
there is a priority of the Jews in chastening for wrongdoing. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. We know that passage back there in, in chapter 1. The gospel is to the Jew first and then also to the Gentiles, but here we find it again over in Romans chapter 2. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. That obviously and clearly ties in with our theme for tonight. All hear, but only some believe. And the astounding thing is this. Now think about it for a second. Where did I just quote out of what book? Romans, that's right. I'm quoting from the book of Romans. And where is Paul talking to the Jewish leaders in our text tonight? Rome! Interesting. But this was written before that event took place. You see, it's a principle that God was teaching and in fact had already sent to the church at Rome. All here, but only some believe. It was to the Romans that Paul wrote this epistle and it is the Roman Jews who demonstrated the truth in real life. We've just read Romans 3, 1 and 2. Now listen to what it says in verses 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? <laughs> the gospel's been preached. They've heard it. Some respond. But verse 3, some don't respond. Some don't believe. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So, the first time we see the principle to the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles, is in the provision of salvation. Jesus the Messiah came to the Jews. But that brought us the second great principle of to the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles, the principle of greater accountability. If you have greater privilege, this is a general subject for the entire Christian community. We're not just talking about, well, we preached the gospel of the Jews first. We did that. It's already been taken care of in the first century, so we don't have to go to the Jews at all today. No, no, no. Forget that kind of an argument. This is a principle that applies across the board. The principle is if you have a greater privilege, you have greater responsibility and therefore greater accountability, the principle of greater accountability. The more you grow up, the more privilege you get, but that also makes you more responsible. Now we have some young people here tonight uh, who one of these days, probably, if dad ever lets go of this particular set of keys, might actually learn to drive a car. Now right now you don't have, you don't have that privilege, right? Do you have that privilege? No. Do you have that privilege? No. Do you have that privilege? Nobody's shaking their head back there. We've got <laughs> some sort of wobbling. We can't tell if it's up and down or if it's side. Yeah, you get the idea. But someday you might have that privilege if Dad doesn't mind a few dents in his car. If you have that privilege, do you have a greater responsibility than if you're not the driver? Let's see some nodded heads from everybody, yes or no. Is there greater responsibility if you have the greater privilege of being able to drive the car? Are you more responsible? Or at least are you more accountable? You may not be very responsible, but are you accountable? Yes, yes, okay, I see a few nodded heads. All right, so you get the idea. The greater the privilege, the greater the accountability, the greater the responsibility. Because at that point, you're holding people's lives in your hands. And so you're held more accountable and more responsible for it. That's one of the most important principles that we can teach our children. Too many young people today want privilege and authority without corresponding responsibility and accountability. They want their so-called rights. You hear that a lot today among young people. But it's my right. Well, with rights come responsibilities. But most young people don't want any obligations or responsibility attached to their rights. 
Young people, it doesn't work that way. If you have privilege, it means you are responsible. If you have rights, it means that you are accountable. If you have authority to make your own decisions, it means that you will be held liable for the results of those decisions. The more blessings you have, the more seriously you will be chastened for abusing those blessings and those privileges. And so the first set of principles related to all here, but only some believe, really have general applicability to all of us. Genuine believing always changes your life. Genuine believing will always make you more accountable. However, failure to believe will not get you off the hook because then you're in an even more serious condition. If you refuse to believe, you're lost. You're headed for hell. Now let's look at the third passage where we see to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. It's in the very next verse in Romans 2.10. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Glory, honor, and peace. We all like that. Yeah, that sounds good. To every man that worketh good, and then he uses that phrase again, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile to the Gentile. That verse gives us the flip side of the coin. If the Jews get spanked first for disobedience, they also get rewarded first for obedience. The greater the obedience, the greater the reward. Let me give you an example. Suppose one child is given the job of feeding the dog once a day. Have any of you in the history of your life, even you ones who are um, mature, <laughs> I want to say old because I'm getting there, uh, mature, have you ever had the responsibility of feeding a dog? If you've had the responsibility, okay. Almost everybody here at some point has had the responsibility for feeding a dog or a cat or a parakeet or whatever you had once a day. Okay, so here we have a situation where one child is given the responsibility of feeding the dog once a day. A different child is given the job of tracking down and killing the mountain lion that has been killing your cattle which is a bigger responsibility? Number one or number two? Everybody who votes for number one, raise your hand. Everybody who votes for number two, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a bigger responsibility to track down and kill a mountain lion than it is to feed the dog once a day, okay? <laughs> okay, so we have a situation like that. Which child's obedience to success in their job will be most highly praised and rewarded? I think you can guess. Now, God gave the Jews an incredible assignment. And he gave them all kinds of information as to what to do with it. It came to the Jews first, then it came to the Gentiles. They are held accountable, but they will also be greatly blessed when they believe. There's coming a day. It's at the end of the tribulation. They have to go through a great deal of chastening first during that seven-year period of tribulation upon the earth. But there is coming a day when every Jew left alive on the face of the earth will turn to Jesus Christ. Right before the end of the tribulation, right before the return of Christ, the second coming, not the rapture. That's at the beginning. Second coming. Right before the entrance into the millennial kingdom. And they will have incredible blessing when you turn to Christ, it changes your life. Think about that for a moment. The Jews had the privilege of the oracles of God. That's what he uses the term here. That is, they had the entire Old Testament. They had the privilege of knowing the law of God. They had the privilege of both the speaking prophets and the writing prophets. They had the books that are called the writings. That's all the historical books of the Old Testament, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and so on like that. They had the privilege of knowing that the Messiah would be Jewish. They had the Messiah actually show up in Israel and initially restrict his ministry to Jews alone. He did a few miracles with Gentiles, but he said, you know, I've been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They got it first. Even on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was for Jewish men only. 
It didn't go to men and women until they went to the half-Jew Samaritans in Acts 8. It didn't go to the Gentiles until Peter brought it to the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. That's almost halfway through the book of Acts. The Jews had the greatest blessing, the greatest foundation in 2,000 years of divine revelation up to the coming of Christ. They had priority of access before any of the Gentiles. Therefore, which is the step two of the Jew first and also the Gentiles, therefore they have the greatest chastening for rejection. That chastening has been going on for the past 2,000 years during what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles. We'll be studying more about the times of the Gentiles when we begin the book of the Revelation and also compare it with Daniel and Ezekiel and several other major sections of Old Testament prophecy where you'll find almost everything in the book of Revelation, at least you have a foreshadowing of it in the Old Testament prophets. But that also means that when they believe, they will also have an incredibly intense blessing. Listen to Romans 2.10 again. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. The second thing that we notice in this passage is that Paul went to the leadership first. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Now, you know, if you remember back to earlier in the book of Acts, what was one of the accusations that the Jewish leaders were bringing against the Apostle Paul. What did they accuse him of when they came before the Roman rulers, both at Jerusalem and also uh, up in Caesarea? One of their accusations was that Paul was subverting the people. But Paul made it clear that he talked to the leadership first so that there would be no basis for that accusation. He was not deceiving the untaught masses. He went to the leadership who should have known their Bibles. They were the leaders of the synagogue in Rome. But even there, God had not chosen all of them. You see, being in a position of religious authority does not necessarily mean that you know the living God. There were some who believed and there were some who did not believe. Perhaps they did not believe when they heard that the leaders at Jerusalem were the ones who had Paul arrested. I mean, he tells them that up front. Maybe they thought Paul was not giving them the entire story because they hadn't heard this from anybody else. But whatever the reason, they rejected the message that Paul brought based on Scripture. Listen, if you make your decisions based on anything but Scripture, you are always going to come to some false conclusions. Some of the guys there at Rome came to false conclusions because Paul only preached the truth. They had some reason in their mind that was standing as a roadblock in believing the truth. Application. You have Bibles. Are you Bereans? You hear me say a lot of stuff from this pulpit. Sometimes some of you probably scratch your head and think, I wonder if that's true. How do you know what's true and what's not true? Be like the Bereans. It says they search the scriptures daily, whether those things, that is the things that the Apostle Paul taught them, whether those things were true. But you might fuss and whine and say, yeah, but that's hard work. It's your job to preach to us, okay? Then if you want to accept everything that I say is true, then act on it. And if you want to say something you don't think is true, prove it from Scripture. That is the final authority. I am not the final authority. The Bible is the final authority. If you hear me preach something that you can prove from Scripture is not true, tell me. But if I preach the truth and you harden your heart, you will give an account. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. 
all here, but only some believe. I hope you catch the serious tone of this message tonight. Because it's not just on the issue of salvation. We've just looked at it three times here. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The ones with the greatest privilege have the greatest responsibility. The ones with the greatest blessing have the greatest accountability. You can't have authority and rights without being held accountable and responsible. You have more than the early church had. You have the entire New Testament. When Paul was preaching, they didn't have, for example, the book of Jude, or 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, or Revelation, or 1st and 2nd Peter. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. You've been given a lot. Anyway, for whatever reason, some of them rejected. Point number three. This principle of all hearing but only some believing is a major theme of the first three chapters of Romans. Not just in those three verses that we read, but the theme itself of of all hearing but only some believing is a major theme in the first three chapters of Romans. It's further developed in Romans later on in chapters 4 to chapter 16 as Paul deals with the doctrine of predestination. It takes great pains to make sure everybody hears by one means or another. God does that. That's the point of Romans chapter 1 and 2. In Romans chapter 1, Paul makes it clear that everybody hears the light of creation, but only some believe. All hear, but only some believe. Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's the quote out of Habakkuk 2.4. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. He hasn't changed his theme. He's talking about God communicating the gospel. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. That word hold there means to suppress it. They hold it down. They know it's there. They know it's true. They don't want to believe it and they don't want anybody else to hear it or believe it. Who hold the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them. And he tells you how he showed it to them. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation. You wonder why I'm a creationist? The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made The invisible things are understood by the visible things. If you want to know something about the invisible things, you look at the visible things. That's why God put them there. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now, what are the last six words? So that they are without excuse, without excuse. All here, only some believe. That's Romans 1. That's the light of creation. You look around you, you look at the textbooks that are being jammed into the heads of the kids in our public schools. Those were written by adults who should know better. Those were written by adults who are going to be held accountable for every child they pervert. And the teachers who take those textbooks are every one of them graduates from college, most of them from teachers' colleges, and most of them with certification in almost every state in the United States from public education authorities who say you are qualified to teach these children. 
and they're teaching them things that are viciously anti-creation, viciously pro-evolution, and because of that there are no moral standards and therefore they teach them that it's okay to be homosexual. And there are textbooks like Daddy's Roommate and uh, Heather Has Two Mommies. Those have been out for years, folks. Teaching little kids in public school that, hey, this is okay. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All here, all see the creation, all experience something about the creation around them, and it holds them accountable. They have revelation from God. They have blessing from God. They are accountable. And if they reject the light they've got, they end in hell. If you accept the light that you have, God gives you more light. But if you reject the light that God gives, the only place to walk is in darkness. Let me read that to you in a more extended context here in just a moment. But Romans 2 makes it clear that everybody hears the light of conscience, but only some believe. Romans 1 is everybody hears the light of creation, but only some believe. Romans 2 is everybody hears the light of conscience, but only some believe. Verse 15, which show the works of the law written in their hearts. Did you know that God has put in the heart of everybody born into this world the moral law of God to know the difference between right and wrong? They don't obey it. They all break it because we're all sinners. But they know it in their heart. It says so which show the work of the law written in their hearts, now listen, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. They rationalize it away. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. They choose what's wrong and then their conscience kicks in. And then they start to rationalize it. And they suppress the truth. And Peter says... If you do that often enough, you sear your conscience so that you no longer have the feeling of conscience and you just go right ahead with your wickedness and your conscience doesn't trouble you anymore because you have burned it so many times. All here, only some believe. All have a God-given conscience, but only some listen to it. Let me read you the extended context. The context proves that all know, but only some believe. They know because God has written his moral law on their hearts. Their consciences condemn them every time they break the moral law of God. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whomsoever thou judge, art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. You knew they were wrong and you did them anyway. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? I see a lot of po hypocritical politics. They accuse somebody and they go after him like mad, and you know they're doing all kinds of investigations when they themselves and their own leaders have been so corrupt in those particular areas. <laughs> and they think we got away with it. Well, we're not going to let him get away with it. Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them that do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? They're not going to get away with it. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and the forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? When God is treating you with goodness, it's not because everything's okay. It's designed to draw you to repentance. It's giving you breathing room. It's giving you opportunity to stop and consider what is it that I've done? And then to repent. The goodness of God, when you experience it, should make you stop and take account of your life. Not just assume 
that everything is okay. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles, for there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter whether you're under it or out of it. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, that is, they had a conscience, and they did what was right, God gave his moral law, it's summarized for us in what we call the Ten Commandments. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. They had a conscience that told them it's wrong to commit adultery. They had a conscience that told them it's wrong to commit murder. They had a conscience that told them it's wrong to steal. They had a conscience that told them, yes, I ought to obey my father and mother. And some of the Jews who already knew the dictated law of God, who gave it word for word and knew it by heart, didn't obey. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts shows that God put it there, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. We're almost out of time. One more thing. That's a threefold means of revelation that God has given. That's what Romans 1, 2, and 3 are all about. Revelation and accountability. It's a revelation and accountability system established by God, and that's the basis for Paul's exposition of the doctrines of election and predestination in Romans 9, 10, and 11. All are accountable, all here by one means or another. All are therefore guilty, which is how Paul ends Romans chapter 3. But only some believe, because only some are among God's elect. Romans 9, beginning in verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us. Now listen, verse 24. Here you're going to find it again. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Do you see that theme? it suddenly pops up. I hope that now when you read your New Testament, you suddenly say, oh, look, here it is again. Oh, look, here it is again. Oh, look, there it is again. Once again, the Jew first and the Gentiles, a consistent theme in scripture. The great equalizer in all of this, which balances out the doctrine of election, predestination, Jew first, Gentile also, is salvation by grace through faith and not by the law. Listen to the very next verses. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Jesus is the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth, that's faith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. All here, 
but only some believe. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it's a sobering thought. You've caused us to hear the word of God tonight. Some will believe and it will change their lives. Some will not believe and that will be proven by no transformation. Father, make us a people who hears and who believes. And when we believe, we will obey. Thank you again, Father, for your word and for its power. In Jesus' name, amen.